Hey everyone, Tom here from Tom's AWI Review. Um, I'm going to try to make this video one more time since uh, the previous attempts have gone like eight minutes and no one wants to hear me ramble for eight minutes. So, um, this is going to be a two-part video. Um, the first is going to be on the versatility of the Warlord Games plastic sets. So it's kind of a review, um, kind of a pat on the back. It's also a, uh, a history video as well on the Butler's Rangers. So it's kind of a mix of both. So the first part I'm going to give you is the actual making of this unit using plastics from Warlord Games. Um, and the other part of this video, the second part, and I'll, I'll let you know when, if you don't want to, if you want the history, if you, if you don't want the history lesson, you can stop it at that point. But if you do, hang tight and, uh, and we'll get to that too. So um, for the, just to start out with, um, what I what I did with my sprues here is I combined the uh, the the, the excuse me a second my cat is doing something stupid at the moment what are you doing what are you, what are you doing you want to get in the video hmm? yeah you want to get in the video okay you're in the video now isn't that nice okay all right um, seems like attacking my GW uh, Citadel battle mat here. It's like, geez, can't find these anymore. Don't ruin it. Um, so yeah, three uh, three sprues that I used for this. The Continental Line uh, sprue, where I got the Light Infantry bodies. Um, the Continental Militia sprue, or the Colonial Militia sprue, which I got some of the other bodies, and also the arms. Um, some of the heads, too. And then uh, the Artillery sprue, which I'm going to show you next, which is where I got most of the, the heads at. And what I did with these... Butler's Rangers has like a really specific headgear that they wore. Uh, it's like a leather hat, like a light infantry hat, but it's uh, it was with the front flap up and it had the crest or the emblem of Butler's Rangers in the center of it. Uh, in order to achieve that look, what I did was I used the artillery sprue with the British, I guess they're like Saratoga helmets or the, the artillery helmets. I don't know exactly what period. I, I think they were at Saratoga mainly, but I, I don't really know the history of the British artillery very well. But I, anyway, the point being is that they came with these helmets um, and this headgear in the sprue, and there's only like five of them that you get per sprue. So I actually had to get a whole bunch of these sprues in order to make this work. And what I did was I just trimmed off the the uh, the top ornamentation right here, and then I shaved it down. And that gave me the the helmets that I, I wanted, the look that I wanted. And when I paint them all up, they'll look even better uh, than what they are right now. And you'll notice the bodies on a lot of these guys are the light infantry from the Continental Alliance sprue. Uh, and I did that because these were rangers. Uh, they weren't... Um, <clears throat> they weren't your typical line unit, so I didn't want to use British line bodies for these I wanted to use light infantry bodies with the belly box with the, the belly box that's on them uh the cartridge box and uh unfortunately the light infantry sprues for the British have the wings on them so I didn't feel like shaving all of them off so it just seemed logical for me to use the kind of line sprue and I think it works out really well um you'll also note a lot of these guys have long rifles and some of them are wearing civilian clothes and some of them are wearing pine frocks this came from the Colonial Militia box. Uh, and so I, what I've done is I've really given most of these guys regimentals. I think like every, I think it's like, I don't know what the, the ratio is. It's like four out of six of them are wearing regimentals. And the rest are wearing a combination of hunting frocks and civilian clothes. And this way they look, they look a little ragged. They look more like rangers, right, that they would be out in the wilderness. Uh, they wouldn't all be wearing regimentals or the regimentals would get torn so they would have to go on to civilian clothes or <clears throat> maybe these guys were fresh recruits or whatever so i wanted to make sure that they had this kind of ragged appearance but that they were all they were all you know identifiable as rangers and so that's what i've done here uh, and i think i was successful at that so here's that that's the general process of of making these um now i'm going to get into the history of the butler's rangers because that's the mindset that i was in when i was making these and and this also will help you out too because if you're if you're kind of bored with the way that all your regiments look i mean after you make like four or five regiments with 
the Warlord games miniatures, it, it's going to it's going to start looking identical. They're all going to look the same, and and that's because there's only so many options that you have um, when putting these arms and things together. And that's not that's not a, a knock at all on Warlord games miniatures because they're great figures and I love them. Um, but it is if you want to have a large army and you want to have large regiments. Like my regiments are all 24 men roughly uh and uh you know not everyone wants that some people want you know 12 man regiments or, or whatever have you you know or they play skirmish games with 28 millimeter and they they're only going to use like 10 miniatures at a time you know well that's that's great and it doesn't really matter but if you want large black powder armies uh you want you want to kind of have some versatility with these god my finger keeps getting in the way i'm sorry guys um and and so this will help you kind of get into that mindset of how how can you make these unique right how can you make make more interesting looking regiments right um that aren't your standard line regiments so basically my mindset going into this was butler's rangers were a loyalist or provincial regiment of rangers that was formed in 1778 on the frontier uh out of fort niagara um now Going into this, I had to do some research on the uh, the uniforms that they were issued, and there really isn't a whole lot of research out there on that, but there is enough. Um, one thing that I will tell you is that there's some there's some controversy about what they wore, right? So some people say they wore green regimentals that are white faced, um, which is probably accurate. They, that was what most loyalists were wearing at the time, and that was what. Fort Niagara had in, in their inventories at the time uh, when this regiment was formed, and they got their regimentals from Fort Niagara, so it makes sense that they had green-faced white uniforms. But that said, I have a lot of green-faced white uniforms already, as you can see with the uh, the regiments, uh, the regiment here, Pennsylvania Loyalists that I put together. Um, they're all wearing green-faced white uniforms, and I didn't want these guys to look that way. I wanted them to look unique. And the other interpretation is that they wore green-faced red uniforms, so green regimentals with red facings. I kind of like that better. I, it might not be as accurate, um, at least not to the period that they're portrayed right now, um, but it is distinctive, right? And that's what I'm going for. I'm going for a distinctive look. And sometimes you have to kind of make that call, right? You have to decide what you want. Do you want historical accuracy or do you want, you know, freaking awesome looking regiments and sometimes they're one and the same um for example with a video that i posted with the fourth new york um you know the four guys i did for the fourth new york with their with, with their white uniforms and red facings they look badass right they they look like they're so unique and distinctive and that they're going to be identifiable on the table and it's historically accurate right sometimes though you have some some flexibility with accuracy and this is one of those times um now in 1778 how these guys were recruited by, by Colonel John Butler uh, is that there was a war going on and I'm not talking about the Revolutionary War. I'm actually talking about the Yankee Penamite War, um, which may, most people don't know about, um, which, which occurred actually before, during, and after the Revolution. Um, basically, Charles II uh, issued several competing land claims. Um, he, he actually issued two grants for the same land uh, in northern Pennsylvania. He issued it to Pennsylvania, and he also issued it to Connecticut. And um, when settlers arrived, they had purchased their property deeds to that region and started establishing settlements. And unfortunately, someone else showed up later and said, well, this is my land, I have a deed. And they said, well, this is my land, I have a deed. And so instead of figuring out a democratic way of getting the property issue resolved, they just went to war with each other. Um, so pretty much we're talking about like a, you know, a, a feudal war or frontier war, kind of just like you can, you can actually kind of use the Hatfields and McCoys as a good example of what kind of war this was. It was brutal. It was, uh, a lot of harassment and, and theft and raiding and, and things like that on the frontier. The Pennsylvanians, uh, also known as the Pennamites, uh, the Pennsylvanians were really, really, really uh, kind of uh, at, at the butt end of a lot of the problems there. I mean, they they could not get help at all from Pennsylvania government. And, and mainly that was because when they finally decided to get help, uh, it was always at a time when there was like a war 
uh, like the French and Indian War, for example, or the, the Pontiac Rebellion, or something was going on that they, um, they just could not get any sort of attention to their plight going on on the frontiers. And, and a lot of these Pennsylvanians were pushed out of their homes or evicted by, by militia, the Connecticut militia would form, and Pennsylvania didn't have any militia laws in the books. So a lot of these guys were, uh, uh, you know, defenseless. Um, you know, a rifle at the time cost a lot of money. Uh, I'll give an example. Um, you know, in, in in probate records and things like that, or, or in, in in lists, uh, there you, you see a lot of um, rifles going for the same amount of money as you know a hundred years of a hundred acres of frontier land. So I mean, it was really expensive to own a rifle or any sort of rifle firearm. At the time, uh, especially if you didn't have any land because you were evicted from it, you couldn't just go out and buy a rifle, right? So, um, you know, you get armed mobs with, like, you know, farm equipment, and, and sometimes that would be effective. Um, but uh, for the most part, the militia the Connecticut had was far more superior because their Connecticut actually had militia laws on the books, and uh, they were, you know, they were well-armed because of the New England um uh, militia laws. So, you know, the Pets Pennsylvanians were really kind of pushed out more often than not. And they, they ended up being, you know, stuck in these terrible, um, you know, kind of like poor towns, right. That they would have to, these like shanty towns that they would have to put up. And a lot of the times they were forced to live with, with native Americans, which at the time, um, was, was unfortunately it was, there's a lot of racism and things like that. So it didn't always work out in Pennsylvania's favor. Sometimes the Indians got fed up with them and, and, you know, tack them or, or vice versa. Um, so, I mean, this, this is the mentality that was part of the region. And what John Butler did was he fed on that. You know, he went in the Pennsylvania shanty towns and said, listen, uh, I know you guys were kicked out of your, your homes. Um, join, join up with the British and, you know, we'll get back at the Connecticut and Pennsylvania governments. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll teach them a lesson for doing what, doing to you what they did to you. Um, and it worked. Uh, you know, he got hundreds of volunteers. Um, and what ended up happening is they would go, uh, they would go from town to town and, and just, you know, raid or pillage or, or slaughter Connecticut settlers. That's what happened at Wyoming. The massacre at Wyoming was um, basically Pennamites who joined Butler's Rangers getting back at the Connecticut militia stationed at Wyoming and um, also the Pennsylvania government for... Uh, for not helping them out because it was, you know, Pennsylvania had basically run the fort at Wyoming um, per the Continental Congress. So, there, you know, there was a lot of this uh, frustration kind of unleashed on that, right? So when I was creating this unit, and God, this, this video is going very long. Sorry about that, guys. Um, when I was creating this unit, I really wanted it to reflect uh, that sort of uh, Pennsylvania rugged frontiersy sort of look and I, I think I did that I think I've gotten enough round hats in there um, which were a favorite among Pennsylvania Dutch and also um, you know I've gotten enough hunting shirts and civilian clothing that it looks like this is uh, you know recruited for wilderness fighting and that these guys had gone through their regimentals already through you know through the wilderness got torn up or whatever and had to replace them with whatever they had. So, I mean, I've, th this is just an idea, right, guys? I mean, it's, it's just a, a really good way for, for someone who's interested in creating some diversity within their regiments um, to kind of have that mindset, say, all right, well, this is what the history of the unit is. How can I portray that in 28 millimeter miniatures? Because, God, I have no life, I guess. I don't know. So, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the... Uh, this little video here and the history lesson. If you have any questions, post them in the comments. Um, you know, if you like it, guys like it. I know it's a long video. Hopefully you guys stay till the end and uh, take care.